This is Barry Zalma, Zalma on Insurance. I'm an attorney who has retired from the active practice of law and now spend my time as an insurance claims consultant, an expert witness, an author, and producer of these videos. Today it's time we spoke about hard fraud. Because for some strange reason, prosecutors and insurance regulators think there are two types of fraud. Soft fraud, where people engage in fraud because of the opportunity presented from a honest loss, to hard fraud where people premeditate fraud. Both are fraud. Both are evil. Both are illegal. Both are crimes. So let's talk about what the states believe to be hard fraud. Those who differentiate between the types of fraud would consider hard fraud because it takes planning, scheming, and even someone in the, on the inside to help get money from an insurance company. An example of hard fraud would be getting into an accident on purpose so that you can claim the insurance money. This example is fairly prevalent lately. Someone hits the brake on an automobile in front of a vehicle that is expected to be insured so that the person behind them can't stop quickly enough. These are sometimes called the classic swoop and squat scheme. Another really severe form of hard fraud would be faking your own death or murder for the life insurance death benefit. The staged loss are fictions created for the sole purpose of presenting a claim. An auto stage loss might be a stage theft where the owner contracts with an intermediary to dispose of a vehicle. The owner gives up the vehicle and then reports it to the insurer as stolen. The person to whom the vehicle is given up will pass it to a salvor who breaks it up into its component parts and sells the parts. These are sometimes called chop shops. Stage theft also includes cases where the insured ships an auto to Mexico, China, Vietnam, or other foreign country, where it is sold, after which the insured makes claim reporting the vehicle stolen and tries to collect for a second time on the value of this allegedly stolen vehicle. All staged thefts are planned and performed for the sole purpose of defrauding an insurer. According to the evidence adduced at trial, the defendant prearranged the stage theft of a truck belonging to a person called Beasley. Any of the error claimed by Beasley was harmless in light of the other overwhelming evidence of Beasley's guilt that was introduced at trial and the cumulative nature of the evidence. Consider United States v. Beasley, a Fifth Circuit decision in 2011. An example of such a claim was explained in a fictional piece in my book Heads I Win, Tales You Lose, currently the newest edition called Everyone Loses from Insurance Fraud, where a fictional Mr. Lee enlisted some of his friends in the Chinese community of Los Angeles to join in his scheme to defraud insurers. They found that all luxury cars were needed in China and enormous profits could be made if duties were not paid. They began their scheme by leasing luxury cars between them 
200 Lexus, Mercedes, Audi, Jaguar, and Infiniti automobiles were leased and insured with major insurers. After making no more than two mo payments on the auto loans, Lee's group began placing the cars in shipping containers at the ports of Los Angeles, Long Beach, and San Francisco. Lee's cousin transported the cars then to Hong Kong and from Hong Kong to Macau to mainland China, where she sold them for hard currency. To finance the purchase of more cars, Lee's group reported the theft of each car to their insurer and had the loans paid off. They were always easy to deal with and never argued with the adjuster's suggested settlement. The conspirators knew they would profit on the sale in Hong Kong or Shanghai. They would replace the car with another leased with the insurance money and start the process over again. Mr. Lee's cousin was the number one luxury car dealer in all of the People's Republic of China. She had no competition, an almost unlimited supply of vehicles and overhead limited to the shipping costs. Lee's account at Citibank Hong Kong was growing. He put his savings in broad-based stock mutual funds, specializing in high-risk emerging markets. His investments doubled in two years. Lee decided it was time to stop while he was ahead. He would ship his personal 1995 Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud convertible, which he had purchased only two months before, to his new home in Hong Kong for his personal use. He did not smuggle the car in a container marked farming implements like the other cars. He shipped it as his personal vehicle. Lee did not know. The U.S. Customs recorded the vehicle identification number of every car that left the United States. Lee did not know that it was a crime in California to ship a car out of the country that secured a debt. Working with customs at every port in the United States is a special agent of the National Insurance Crime Bureau who records the VIN numbers of every car shipped in its database. Every insurer who is a member of the NICB has access to the database. Each member company records every car reported stolen to the database. When Lee reported his car stolen to the massive and stony insurance company of Beacon, Illinois, they automatically filed a report of the theft to the NICB. They assigned an adjuster who began a cursory investigation. The report of the theft was believable, and but for the value of the vehicle, a commonplace occurrence in Los Angeles. The adjuster recommended immediate payment. Roger Parsons, the claim supervisor at the similarly fictional Massive and Stony Insurance Company, looking out his window at the slow-moving Brown Illinois River, was about to order a check for the settlement when he received a report from the NICB that the car had been shipped by Lee to Hong Kong a month before the reported theft. Customs officials in Hong Kong reported the car arrived and was picked up by its consignee. The NICB had, had copies available of the shipping documents with Mr. Lee's signature. When the claim was presented and an examination under oath was demanded, the evidence was prevented presented after Lee swore falsely about the theft, and the claim was effectively denied. Another kind of intentional hard fraud is abandonment. The owner abandons a vehicle on a city street or in a parking lot, creating a moral hazard. The insured will report the vehicle stolen and attempt to collect before it is recovered. Then there is 
dumping. When the owner disposes of a vehicle by dumping it into a lake or other body of water. Cars have been found buried underground, and some lakes have been found to have more than 50 cars underwater. In 2009, Newsweek reported, quote, For example, the South Carolina man who earlier this year filed an insurance claim, saying his 2002 Ford F-150 was stolen, police quickly discovered it only miles from his house, engulfed in flames. Investigators couldn't find any sign of forced entry, but what they did discover was that the owner was behind on his payments, had refinanced the truck twice, and had lied about when it when asked. In a similar incident, a California woman who was no longer willing to fuel up her 2002 GMC Yukon said it disappeared from the parking lot. Actually, she had arranged to have it chopped up in Mexico and sold off it as parts. And then there's the Arizona man who couldn't afford the payments on his 2006 Dodge Charger, who told his daughter's boyfriend that he would give them his blessing to marry if the boyfriend would only torch his car for the insurance money. This type of car insurance fraud occurs when the owner disposes of the vehicle by leaving it somewhere, burning it, dumping it in a lake, or even selling it and then claiming it was stolen. In situations where the car was sold before being reported stolen, the fraud is intended to pay in two ways, through an insurance settlement to replace the stolen vehicle and through the sale of the original car. Then there's a false registration. Where you live affects what you pay for car insurance, and this car insurance scam is designed to mislead insurers and avoid higher premiums. Drivers who partake in the scam often live in expensive parts of the country or in neighborhoods with higher theft rates, so they register their cars in other states or counties where insurance premiums can be lower. Another form of hard fraud is where the insured exaggerates repair costs after an accident. This is a fraud committed by less than upstanding repair shops. By repairing a car with cheaper, possibly unsafe parts and billing the car insurance company for new parts they never used, or work they never perform, they're committing fraud for financial gain. Body shops can also commit exaggerated repair cost fraud by overcharging an insurer and a customer for necessary repairs, by purposely overstating accident damages, the shop can make money after unneeded repairs. Fires, of course, are also used to avoid lease penalties. Most automobile leases include penalties as much as 15 cents per mile over a preset limit. I once saw a case where a Porsche was leased with a $5 a mile charge over a preset limit. When the lessor learns that such charges are considerable, and the owner has insufficient funds to pay off the lease, the insured lessee will often take the vehicle to a remote location, set it afire so that it is totally destroyed, and then report it stolen. Real and personal property are often the victim of a different kind of arson for profit, of fires set by or on behalf of the insured for the sole purpose of defrauding an insurer for profit. An examination of the market can reveal all of the classic indicators of an arson for profit fire rather than a fire started by vandals. An expert would seek the following indicators. One, 
the elaborate and intricate fire setup with punctured gas cans, two, the cigarette and matches near the deep fryer, and three, the removal of the vent to give the fire better ventilation. Vandals who set fires do not think about giving ventilation to the fire. When an arson profit perpetrator gives attention to ventilation by propping open the front door and all windows in the house is an indication of an arson for profit. The existence of trailers to extend the fire into the far reaches of the dwelling once it got started was a key indicator of arson for profit, as was the existence of a low inventory in a commercial structure as well as evidence that the insured removed items they wanted before setting the fire, establish an arson for profit. This video was adapted from my book, Zelma on Insurance Claims, Part 109, Second Edition, one of the ten-part treatise, Zelma on Insurance Claims, which is available as both a Kindle book and a paperback from Amazon.com. If you found this video to be interesting or useful to you or your colleagues, please pass it on. It's free. And please also subscribe to my YouTube channel, my Rumble channel, and my blog so that you can learn of future blog postings and future videos. Thank you for your attention.